you for coming and choosing to listen to me. I'm M, and I'm a sound designer at A Shell in the Pit Audio. And today I hope that I can help give some insight into how sound can help with storytelling. It's been the focus of my work for a while now, and I think it'd be great if everyone paid att more attention to it. So Night in the Woods was an inspiration to work on as a sound designer. The writers Scott Benson and Bethany Hockenberry included a whole bunch of sound into the story, and Alec Holoka incorporated it into the music and as a cohesive whole. And Alec's right there. <laughs> um, and Gordon McGladdery and Joey Van Alden of A Shell in the Pit gave me a ton of support to explore, as well as uh, actual sound and moral and creative support. Joey also did the sound for Demon Tower, the game within the game. So the sound design and these ideas I'll, I'll be sharing were a collaboration between all of us. So this is a story about a place and a time. It's told through setting, atmosphere, and characters. And my goal with the sound was to reflect this and bring you closer into the setting to make you feel as though you are May, feeling as she would feel in this place. And so every one of the 5,090 sounds in the game make a contribution to the story. Uh, even with the Foley, Scott gave me the direction to make May's footsteps and cloth sound as if she were an ungraceful potato sack. <laughs> so these two television characters also add by helping establish the mood in this opening scene. Even without looking at the dialogue, things feel a little bit ridiculous and a little bit off. There are awkward silences, laughter, clapping, all entwined with the voices to make it feel alive. Being alive in terms of sound means chaos. It means that if there is a repetitive action like this conversation, there will be a corresponding set of variable sounds that trigger randomly. Being alive also means rhythm and movement in everything. It means that sound comes from both known and unknown sources. That sense of liveliness is all bundled up under the umbrella of feeling. To be alive is to feel, so everything inside Every scene has its own mood. How do you feel about being here, and why? I made each different ambience by taking the feelings Scott's art gave me and giving them voice. Literally, what better way to convey a sense of life than human breath? So I used my own voice for a lot of the sound effects and ambiences. I made most of the wind sounds by blowing into the microphone like this and cutting them into short segments that faded in and out and turning it into a scatterer ambience, which is a sound that gets triggered at random time intervals as well as a random position in space. I used this particular layer as an element in almost every outdoor scene to create a persistent lonely atmosphere and I reuse signature or thematic sounds a lot because I find it helps in manipulating you subconsciously. Also, this was our implementation tool of choice, FMOD. I'm not gonna talk too much about it, though. So here, the fireflies change from fluttering to chirping when you jump into a swarm, like they're excited to be with you. They react both visually and audibly. So in the real world, we react to things as they happen. They give us memories. We live with all of our senses. So having a character react to a sound at the same time you're experiencing it makes it feel as though all the elements belong together. Like, this is a real world. I was pretty excited to discover moments like this throughout the script. And a fun fact is that the sound of one firefly is actually the sound of a bunch of frogs. So in this real world, the characters have their own agency. This ambience was one of the first ones I made. I wanted to give, give May's home a comforting sense of life, and so I decided this meant waking up and hearing your mom bustling around downstairs and humming. Later in the process, Alec pointed out that it didn't make too much sense 
because when you go downstairs, May's mom is just sitting there reading. Uh, but instead of taking it out, I decided to create a little narrative each morning and have May's mom finish up and sit down right as you come down the stairs. So this is an example of a sound coming from an unknown source, as, and it also has the special purpose of letting you know that she's there to talk to if you want. Where is Angus off to? Ah, yes. Grabbing the USB stick he has handy under a couple pieces of paper on his desk. Off-screen sound can really help if you don't have enough time to animate everything, and it doesn't have to be something that was left out. It can be a choice. That rummaging sound only took a couple minutes to make, so you can really use that to your advantage. Um, if you're a writer, you can plan for it, and if you're a sound designer, you can look carefully for those moments where you can add continuing movement and fluidity and connect little narrative threads. Um, and it doesn't have to be an obvious action either. Just like May's house, this location has its own story and we can hear the neighbors, which hints that Angus and his partner Greg live in a less than ideal location with thin walls. And it tells us that they live among people who are living their own story. They're watching a movie. Uh, and it's outside of what we're experiencing with the main characters. So we come back to the town every day, so it was important to enhance that sense of liveliness. The telephone wires respond to us, sounding higher in pitch in the end and lower in the middle, and they have a higher probability of rattling in the middle. Everything we can jump on responds to us differently. The squirrels react to the environment outside of what the player is doing, filling the landscape with little footsteps on each different surface. And to achieve this effect, I took a little rock and tapped it against some concrete or a chair or my guitar strings, which is what the telephone wires are made of. And I also made the car sounds using a highly advanced and unique process, which I will demonstrate now. <laughs> um, the main town ambience is filled with randomly triggering sounds. The train from earlier passing by every 90 to 300 seconds. Townspeople that we can't see are calling out to one another, and we've got the wind and birds chirping between one to three seconds. <laughs> Um, each different time interval was a deliberate choice that says something. So this is a kind of a silly detail, but the pigeons have a 44% chance of pecking a seed and a lower chance of breaking it open. <laughs> it seems minute, but adding probability helps make the world sound less repetitive. And as creators of this world, we never know how intimate you're gonna get with any given space. I did all this detail to help sell the idea, again, that you are May, and you're waking up every day and moving through this ever-changing town. And it does change visually as well. Everything is centered around the passing of time. Uh, so if you decide to stand in one place for a while, you'll hear more than a loop, the ambiences were designed to situate you in time, and in the spirit of the many procedural visuals are always random. So ambiences were really important in the sound design of this game. Each different atmosphere was another opportunity for immersion, whether it's hissing pipes passing by, a reverb that suggests a deep, dark tunnel, or a chef who's humming along to the background music every day. We took all the opportunities we could think of to blend sound effects and music together. Like here, Alec, who is the composer, asked for the sound of the train to have the same BPM as the music. The sound effect actually made it onto the soundtrack, which I was pretty excited about. And we often used a real-time parameter control to determine how sounds change based on the game state or your actions. 
So in this case, I like the idea that as you climb higher in the town, the wind builds up and the music loses its low frequencies and gets quieter. So this bottom track is a gradual high pass filter and the two top tracks are the wind fading in. So once you get to the top, you can hear once again that lonely wind and it creates a moment for May. It feels different than standing on the street, like you've accomplished something and you can listen to the pigeons finding seeds. Similarly, when you walk into a store, the music is different than on the street. It is diegetic, which means that it exists for the characters and the story as a part of their world. And so here, it sounds as if it's coming from the speakers in this location, which if it interests you, I made happen with a convolution reverb called fog convolver, a little bit of EQ, and some delay. Diegetic music can really help create moments and affect mood. So here, May and her friend B are having an argument. In the middle of the conversation, the record that was playing fades out, and you're left hearing the needle. It makes things serious and uncomfortable. And sometimes silence is more powerful than music and it can make more music more meaningful in contrast. So we should try to avoid carpet bombing our stories with music, even if it's super good. I think that we should choose our moments for both. We can also get creative with how we transition from one song to another. So how would someone playing obnoxious guitar at a real party do it? When we first started in on the sound design work, we weren't sure whether or not to include some kind of voiceover. I knew we had made the right decision to admit it the first time I watched someone stream the game. They read all the lines in different silly voices and it seemed to me as if they were really able to embody the characters. And I think our voices might have got in the way of that a little bit. Uh, this wasn't immediately obvious though, so the original plan was to trigger a vocalization of a single emotion for each different speech bubble. We did have an elaborate range of emotions that we recorded in the voices of May, Greg, and Bruce, um, and it wasn't until the team tested these out together that we realized that it would be unrealistic to implement them all on top of the creative reasons. But here's a small sampling of some of the emotions, starting with May. Uh, this is exasperated. And here's weird. <laughs> Chuckle. Sarcastic. Which probably would have been used a lot. <laughs> Annoyed. Uh, this one is <laughs> drunk. <laughs> we had a lot of fun <laughs> doing these. <laughs> um, oops. And uh, this is mischievous. And jump, which actually did make it into the game. As well as injured. Um, and this was a range of Greg, who is particularly weird because we were trying to base him off a fox. I don't know if you've ever heard of fox. Um, <laughs> with a mix of a dude Scott showed us from a reality show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's all of that. There's a lot more of those, too. <laughs> um, I did, however, using a lot of voice work for background characters. In this case, to make it feel like there are real live weirdos getting drunk in the woods. And I say weirdos because if you actually listen to what, what's going on, again, it's pretty strange. Uh, Greg Lobanov and Chris Tamek helped me out with most of these. And we didn't give each other mo much direction, just kind of went nuts and saw how much we could make each other laugh. Uh, for some of it, we even went into the woods to capture the space and probably seriously freaked some people out. 
Um, so be as weird as possible because sometimes something you laugh forever at with a friend is also something other people think is funny. Uh, this was turned into a 10 hour YouTube video. <laughs> Uh, we also all voice different genders because I think it's always good to blur those lines. Um, another fun fact is that I can do a pretty good grandpa laugh. <laughs> so be weird and always be imagining what could be happening in each different space. I imagined this loudspeaker lady being really bored. like. Maybe she's actually just sputtering nonsense because it's all she has to do. So now we can talk about the fun, creepy stuff. Uh, for May's dreams, I once again breathed weirdly into a microphone, this time with as much creepy intention as possible. I made a palette of sounds to use in connection with these astral projections May starts having. I made one sound especially for the dark being in the universe, who I won't say too much about, except that if you listen, you'll hear a deep, slow, uh, pitch down breathing track. And to get you more into May's head during the scary scenes, or when you're sleeping, I also recorded some shallow breathing using binaural microphones, so it can sound like your own. Um, I also use some of these sounds as scatterers, so they behave just like the wind I talked about before. And I did, in a few cases, add too much detail and had to scale back for performance issue reasons. So if I did it again, I would start by making the ambiences more condensed, but it was a learning process. So my interpretation of this dream is that a tear is made in the universe and it unleashes all the horrible sounds that continue to pop up after this, as if it breaks open May's head and leaves a portal to this dimension, which is why I added all those ambient layers to this big important moment. So you make those associations. And this breathing track that comes in now was actually an accident where for some reason the track in the event itself didn't fade out with the rest of the sound between scene transitions. Um, but I think sometimes accidents and the randomness of the system kind of work and I ended up quite liking that effect. So I took those signature sounds from the dreams and placed them at moments in the story in the real world that meant something to emphasize a connection. Uh, I added the sound whenever a particular being is around and made it get louder the longer you stay there using an ADHSR. And I imagined again that it's coming from May's head as if you're hearing what she's hearing. Uh, and I didn't do any of this imagining that you would think about it consciously, but I think that just because something isn't consciously noticed doesn't mean it's not working as a functional part of the story. And it doesn't mean it's not noticed at all. Sound is an emotion, it's an intangible feeling, and we notice the feelings it gives us, even if we don't pinpoint the source. Um, I didn't find that discouraging, but I find it powerful. Uh, one of my least favorite expressions in the sound design industry is that if you've done a good job, people won't notice. And I would argue that we shouldn't go seek to go unnoticed, but instead to provoke people into listening by making them feel shit. Um, and sometimes the game can respond to the sound. I implemented that signature sound idea and was surprised and super excited to discover it written into the story later on. I got this idea to try to affect you emotionally with a signature sound from inside. I was terrified by the horrible water demon in that game and I realized that I could tell when it was near because they would play an ominous musical tone, uh, which I first noticed when I approached a hatch and uh, it had been placed there as a spot ambience and I felt fear building. 
and I didn't want to open the door and confront the creature and he would be there. I spent a long time just standing there um, and it made a huge emotional impact. So whenever May is approaching something dark, the volume of the horrible sound is increased the closer you get. I wanted to make you uneasy and reluctant to move forward. Uh, so when May starts out on the right in this scene, you can hear an active forest. There are birds and movement in the bushes. And as you progress, they all go silent, which again was all in the script. And then as the horrible sound, then the horrible sound starts coming in. loud sound you heard has a very specific purpose in the story, but I won't say what it is. <laughs> so to give you a little summary with interactive narrative, all the different possible ways the game could sound is what turns it into something special. Just like in life, the world responds to our actions. It would be impossible to predict all the interpretations, but what I tried to do here was lay out the clues and suggest certain feelings. I went about it by playing the game over and over and over with an open mind, each time trying to think of what details might be noticed. I was always trying to make connections, influence emotion, and insinuate that the characters are doing their own thing and that the world is changing. <laughs> so, this neat little presentation may have made it seem like I knew what I was doing all along, but I want to assure you that at the time, I certainly did not feel that way. It was a learning process, and it wasn't as succinct as this. And I say this to encourage you not to worry about that in yourselves. I was able to do this work just because I loved what I was doing, and I love this game, and I immersed myself in it, and didn't think about all the people that were going to play. I pushed away my awareness that this was my first release as the lead sound designer and didn't let that make me too afraid to try all this stuff. I just did what I know. I got weird and I experimented and followed my intuition along the lines of what the team created. And on the topic of encouragement, I'll also mention that coming to speak at GDC was real scary for me, uh, but I did it anyway because I think that we who might be more anxious about this sort of thing, especially as few women are not binary people in games, and even fewer in game audio, need to start pushing that fear of being seen away and show each other that we are here and that we are doing cool stuff. Uh, and that being here is lots of fun, so if you wanna get into this kind of career, you should, no matter who you are. And once you do, don't be afraid to put yourselves out there. I think each time you do something like this, you grow exponentially with it. Uh, and lastly, I want to stress again how much of a team effort the sound was, especially with Alec, and I can't really express how lucky I feel to have been able to work on a project like this with these people. So try to find people who inspire you to tell stories and keep thinking of new ways to tell stories and think about how much sound can impact those stories. We have a lot more exploring to do, uh, so let Sharkle lead you to the stars. Thank you. <laughs> so I think we have time for questions. Do we have time for questions? Okay. Uh, so you can ask those now. Here's my Twitter also. Uh, I think there's a microphone if you if you have them. <laughs> That's cool too if if no one does. <laughs> hey, Hi. so very good talk. Thank you for it. Um, one thing that I got out of this and out of playing Night in the Woods was that I, I really appreciated your ability to do so much with so little. Um, and to really contribute to crafting this world um, with such a delicate touch. And I'm wondering um, if you have any tips for 
So I'm, I'm coming from, as, as a sound designer, I, I feel like a lot of what I need to do to, to feel like a good sound designer is, is focus a lot on quite the opposite. It's putting more and more into it. And I'm wondering if you have any tips on how to train that sort of restraint and focus on the little details. Hmm. Um, I would say to, I guess, I guess my strategy is to record as much as possible. So I, when I use library sounds, I often tend to put a lot of layers in as opposed to just finding the right sound that you don't need to add more um, to make sound good. And I think, yeah, having going out and just finding it in real life and recording it is a nice way to do that. <laughs> Makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Hi. Hi. Was there a... Was there a particular environment or set of sounds that you found uh, particularly challenging? Um, I think, I guess, I, I don't know if it was particularly challenging, but the, all the dark sequences definitely took a lot more effort and the, the dreams. I went through a lot of iteration where I was constantly going back and tweaking little things. Um, they, they felt really important in the story, so I wanted to make sure they were just right. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, so as someone who also really loves recording just a bunch of random things and like finding cool combinations, um, what was the most fun or like weird thing you foleyed for the game? <laughs> um, I think I think, I mean, it's not really fully, but the weirdest stuff we recorded, I think, was definitely the, the voices. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah, it's kind of hard to remember everything, but I, I'll just say the voices. They're very good. <laughs> Hi, brilliant really presentation. You should be proud. Uh, um, thank you. You mentioned at one point you sometimes went a little too far, and like we're going into too much detail or complexity in designing something. So when that was happening, like how did you, what made you realize you were going further than you needed to? Did you realize yourself, or did other people say, maybe we don't need this much? Well, it, when I really realized it, it was technical, and it was actually, it, it was kind of a mix of going too far and also just setting stuff up wrong. So I, uh, had all of these layers in the town ambience, and one of them was a scatterer, which is uh, the one that gets triggered at a random time, and I had it getting triggered like way too frequently, <laughs> and it was just a mistake, and it kind of made me go back and reevaluate you know how many voices I was using and and think about performance a little more on a whole um, so but and and it just made me realize that that's that's a really good thing to do from the start. <laughs> Thank you very much. No problem. Uh, great work. I love this sound design in this game so much. And the the dream with the train sound effect was like my favorite dream of all of them. So <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that one was fun. <laughs> uh, a personal curiosity I had is like when you're in that like under tunnel with the the cook, and it's got like that kind of boomy reverb. Mm -hmm. Was that baked into the sounds you were playing, or did you have like a live effect? Doing yeah, that? so I, I have um, everything going through sends, and I have a few different reverbs for each different location. Um, so, and that was all done in F mod. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. No problem. Hi. Um, wonderful Good. talk. Thank you. Um, when you were designing, did you think of the characters as people or animals or kind of both? <laughs> um, I, I think it was a mix of both. I mean, they are supposed to just be people, but I guess because we started out with those voices, mm. um, it kind of just put me in the mindset of that. Uh, like, the voices I did for May, I was kind of going like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, But mostly people, I think, because, yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. OK. Looks like all the questions. Um, I can go to the wrap-up room for 20 minutes, and then I um, would encourage everyone to attend. There's a Women in Game Audio roundtable 
in the South Hall, that's always really good. So I'm gonna go to that directly after. <laughs> and thanks again. <laughs>